Hey everyone, it's Judy Warner with Altium's On Track Podcast. Welcome back. We are glad to have you join us again. Today we have a very unique topic and speaker, which was actually brought about by Mark Okamura, who is the Senior Principal Hardware Engineer from ETS Lindgren, who reached out to me and asked me about the topic of surface finishes. And lucky for you, I happen to know the guy who is a chemist and expert on surface finishes, a longtime friend, Mike Carano from RBP Chemical. Before uh, Mike and I get started, I wanted to please invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. I'm at Altium Judy, and Altium is on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And also please know that we're recording on YouTube in case you want to see our sunshiny faces. So... Um, Mike, welcome. Thanks so much. We're thanks, delighted Judy. to have you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's good to know friends in high places, right? So, well, I, I have friends in low places, so I don't, <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, maybe. Um, so, Mike, I got a question. Um, first of all, let's talk about uh, your background a little bit. So, as way of introduction, Mike Carano... Um, was inducted into the IPC Hall of Fame a few years ago, and I had the privilege of doing the video interview that was highlighting his induction into the IPC Hall of Fame because he has served on so many committees and boards for IPC, but he really is um, the go-to guy on chemistry. So Mike, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into chemistry specifically related to printed circuit board and electronics industry. Well, you know, sometimes, Judy, things happen by, by accident. Um, uh, really, uh, chemistry was always, and sciences were always a love of mine, so I always liked to experiment, and the parents got me the, the chemistry set, and, you know, everything from blowing up golf balls to, you know, making things at home, everything from even experimenting with making wine. Uh, that's chemistry. Um, that seemed like a good thing to do. Right. But I, I also realized that probably uh, owning a vineyard would not be in the immediate future. So onward and upward with chemistry, particularly the area of physical and advanced chemistry, electrochemistry. Uh, working on a master's degree, I happened to be walking up from campus one day back in uh, 1980. 24 years old and uh, there's a gentleman standing outside this building and he he noticed my chemistry books he says hey come here i want to talk to you i thought oh what's this about and i realized <laughs> the sign on the door there in youngstown ohio city electrochemicals and he asked me if i wanted to interview for a for a position there um well it was a perfect because uh, graduate school was more part-time uh, i was doing some teaching assistance and uh, what do you know i interviewed for this thing on surface finishing chemistry and uh, having, having no idea really what I was getting into, but I did. The idea was finish my master's degree, go on and do something else, maybe do this for two years. Well, 39 years later, uh, here I am still <laughs> in the industry in some way, shape or form. So that's how I got into this. And as the company, uh, Electrochemicals in those days, uh, founded in the, on primarily on the metal finishing industry, you know, surface finishing for, you know, doorknobs and bumpers and decorative plating. Mm. Well, the company was just then getting into printed circuit board chemistry. And uh, a lot of people didn't even know what that was in those days because it was a fledgling industry. There was right. a mostly, uh, as you know, remember, Judy, way back then was 80% of the industry was, was really run by the OEMs, so the digital yeah. equipments. The, the Delphi's, the Delco's, the IBM's, but pretty soon there was that switch. And then I got involved in IPC and pretty soon formulating chemistries and technical service, traveling globally uh, around the world was, was a fascinating for me. And uh, here I am today and still uh, still in the industry in some, one way, shape or form. You know, you evolve, you, you continue to evolve. Matter of fact, just like surface finishes, they've evolved yeah, right. uh, to where we are today. And I'm sure they'll continue to evolve uh, in the very near future. Yep, for sure. So can you give us a quick overview? I know you were with OMG for many, many years, and mm -hmm. um, now you're with RBP. Can you give us a quick sure. thumb nutch of RBP? And uh, absolutely. Great opportunity, great company. Uh, privately owned. It's a veteran-owned small business. Uh, we are The company is based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was founded in 1954 and has remained singularly held, privately held. Uh, the current CEO and, and majority owner is, is Mr. Mark Cannonberg. Uh, he's my immediate uh, boss. Mark is a, a 
served in Vietnam. He's a West Point graduate and also a Harvard MBA, but he always wanted to kind of get in the business of in owning his own company, even though he had many, many opportunities. So he's now been running RBP uh, for these last 30 years uh, under his control, and the, the company has grown beautifully. It's uh, Initially, the company was founded as a supplier of materials and chemistries for the printing industry, newspapers, newsprint, magazines, but over the years also evolved into surface finishing, surface treatment, and printed circuit board chemistry, which is the company, as I said, continues to evolve today. And we have four major product lines, the print, printed circuit board, and photochemical milling chemistries. We have a great product line in the area of embedded medical devices. And we also serve the semiconductor and the mining industries with some specialty additives. Like a lot of people don't understand the connection, but there's a connection all the way through the platforms because the chemistries are basically adapted to work in all those industries, which makes it makes working with RBP, you know, fascinating for me. Right. Is diversification, but yet the, the the continuity and the familiarity. So great opportunity, and I've enjoyed it immensely. Good. Well, good. Um. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. So let's jump right into surface finishes. I'm sure most of our listeners who are engineers and designers will be familiar with surface finishes, but let's just go back to our ABCs for a second and just define surface finishes for us for PCBs. Sure. That is the part of the board that is really going to be used to prevent oxidation of the base metal. As you know, Typically, we have copper as the base metal. If you're using the solder mask over bare copper method, where you basically uh, put solder mask down, that nice green stuff, and the copper is showing, you have to make that copper solderable. You have to preserve the solderability. So typically, prior to that board going out to the assembly operation, the copper has to be basically made pristine with a finish that does not oxidize so that you can join the component leads, whatever they may be, whether they be surface mount, through hole, BGA, QFNs, QFPs, they have to be able to, to wet that surface and form a reliable joint. So the surface finish is critical for that application and for that end product. So um, tell us, give us just a rundown of what the surface finishes are, and then we're gonna jump into which one to use when. Sure. Well, you know, here in North America, and primarily for the military, we're still using, at least 50 or so percent of the industry uses hot air solder leveling. Basically, you're taking that solder mask over bare copper board, flexing it, cleaning the copper, and then dipping it into a molten solder pot to coat the, the surface. But, you know, over the years, due to a lot of other constraints, one of them was to get rid of lead. And even though we have lead-free hot air leveling, the other surface finishes have evolved. And matter of fact, have taken center stage primarily outside of North America. These surface finishes are, we hear the, the term ENIG, which is electroless nickel immersion gold. We also hear about electroless nickel electroless palladium immersion gold, also known as ENAPEG. And while that may be an expensive finish, you see that used quite a bit in the packaging industry, the semiconductor packaging, IC substrate industry. Then there is OSP, organic solderability preservatives, which is actually the, the only one of these to be non-metal containing. And then we have immersion silver and immersion tin. And again, we expect that there'll be other renditions of these uh, finishes coming up in the near future, potentially a tin silver or direct palladium over copper to get rid of the gold altogether. There's a lot of movement in this area to enhance the, the surface finish reliability, but at the same time, manage costs. Because you see how know, precious metals like gold and palladium can contribute significantly to the cost of that board, which then you know makes you wonder, okay, what, what finish should I use and when should I use it? So that's, yeah. the, that's kind of a rundown of our finishes. And each one of them, and I can tell you this, Judy, when people ask me, and I travel all over the world, what finish should I use? Yeah. Well, no one, no one finish fits all. And that's, that's a just, loaded question, so, isn't it, Mike? Exactly. Well, it, it depends. That's the answer. Depends, yeah, exactly. right? Um, well, as I mentioned in the beginning, this gentleman, Mark Okamura, reached out to me and said, are you ever going to talk on your podcast or do you have any information about surface finishes? Because in his particular case, and his is just one of many, um, many high frequency application engineers and designers have found out the hard way that if they use ENIG, 
um, the electrical nickel nickel over immersion gold that if it's high frequency then we have the skin effect and then the signal begins moving through the nickel and the nickel is lossy and unfortunately mm -hmm. people have, that's a well-known issue it's been going on forever but it seems like people have learned that the hard way unfortunately one at a time so that's just one example so can we talk about um when we talked a few weeks ago, you talked about environment playing a mm -hmm. huge role on how to make selection on your surface finishes. So can you jump sure. into that a little bit? And what I mean by environment is where where is that final product going to be used? Um, and let's let's let me just preface it this way. If you're in this industry, whether you're in the printed circuit board industry directly or in the you're an assembler or you're an OEM, Choosing the final finish for that product may be the most important decision you make because it is going to impact that long-term reliability of least of that solder joint. And I mean solder joint, I, I'm using it interchangeably with lead-free as well. And compounding that is, again, where are the boards going to be used, the finished boards? Harsh use environments such as automotive under the hood, military aerospace, that's one application. But then what about consumer items like Mobile phones, smartphones, uh, desktop computers, uh, smart smart tablets, um, household devices. You know, you don't need a a product or a finish that adds nine dollars a surface square foot to the board if you're using it in a washing machine in your house or in a microwave or even a desktop or laptop computer. Um, now, military aero, uh, things like class three or class three A that have to work. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and can't fail, right? Can't fail. You may look at that and you say, well, do I need ENIPEG? Do I need ENIC? But will OSP also work? And some people really are surprised when they find out that OSP is a very reliable finish. It's not wire bondable, but in terms of reliability and forming the copper tin in a metallic and having a reliable solder joint, it's fantastic. So think about that. It also happens to be the lowest cost finish. But I'm my I am of the opinion, and I ask somebody this, and I list ten things. I have cost of the finish at the bottom, because that should not be the driving force of what you put on the board. It's the environment where the board is used, uh, and then you ask yourself other questions. Is cosmetics important? Do I have to have a shiny silvery finish? Okay, or don't don't I need one? Uh, am I worried about shock drop? You know, for example, if something I have in my hand drops a lot, like a cell phone, smartphone, you worry about brittle fracture of the components actually fracturing when that phone hits the ground. We've all dropped our phones. Yeah. And the mobile phone companies, the you know, the Apples of the world and the Samsungs conduct drop test, shock drop test all the time because that's important criteria. You don't want to spend the money on a new phone, drop it, and find out the components fell off. Right. So that's and that's why you don't see Enig used a lot on the, on the smartphone. You use things like something that makes a much stronger copper tin in a metallic bond. Whereas, whereas with Enig, you know, your your tin is formed with the nickel. So it's a tin nickel bond, not a tin copper bond. Mm -hmm. So that's – and we all know, and there's been hundreds of papers published by many, many companies and, and fantastic researchers around the world showing that – the tin to copper intermetallic is much stronger than the tin to nickel intermetallic. So that's something to consider as well, not just the cost. But you might use ENIG in, in uh, medical devices. Um, we know the military is starting to look at ENIG as a, as a final finish, but they also do some things to ensure the reliability of that component as it is attached you know, to the surface. So there's a number of, like I said, there's a myriad of things to look at. Besides, oh, is corrosion, no, corrosion environment. Yeah, we've heard of creep right. corrosion. And that's that's an issue. And silver s tends to be somewhat prone to creep corrosion, again, but in an industrial environment, kind of outside or in a uh, clay modeling studio or in a paper mill where sulfur is emitted. Mm, um, that's interesting. So, so if, if you told me, well, I want to put, uh, I'm, I'm making this part because I work for General Motors and I'm modeling, I'm going to use clay to model my next car. And I'm going to have all these computers hooked up inside that studio. I think, I'll think I'll use boards with silver on them. Well, you probably don't want to because <laughs> yeah. your, your, your work is going to be lost. So that's, that's one, uh, one consideration. 
as I said, shock drop is another. But again, where are you using the final product? Industrial automation, you're using it outside, base stations, all of those things. Controllers, industrial controllers where you know, we're, we're subjected to not just environmental contaminants, but maybe significant vibration, temperature extremes, et cetera. So always look at the environment, where you're using it, and what the reliability requirements are. Can you, you know, can you afford the warranty? What is the warranty when you take something back? And if it's inexpensive, you know, you can use an inexpensive finish. But if it's if the f- cost of failure is, you know, magnitudes great, you you should rethink about that finish what you're going to use and how you're going to use it. That totally makes sense to me. Um, You had mentioned that a lot of people think that OSP, they think of it generally as a sort of low-tech product, but you were pushing back against that when we discussed that. Why why is that? Well, you know, 25 years ago, yeah, OSP was what you would call the single attachment finish. One reflow, maybe one through hole, and that was it. It, would, it lasted four to five months, whereas the other finishes like hot air leveling, one year, two year shelf life. Okay. Well, that's changed. You know, companies have made significant improvements in the reliability and also the, the ability of the OSP to reduce oxygen penetration on the copper. And that, again, is what you're trying to do. You're trying to prevent the underlying copper from oxidizing so that when the solder melts and spreads on the surface it spreads and makes encapsulates the leads on the on the on the uh, components and solidifies and it's highly reliable if the surface is oxidized even slightly and doesn't wet properly you, yeah. you've lost your reliability but uh, osp has come on strong now and, and you see automotive under the hood major telecommunication companies using it for the reasons of getting away from brittle fracture, you see them in smartphones, significant number of smartphones. And I have some experience in those areas. So um, I'm talking from, from personal experience. Um, the reliability is there with the right finish. Now the low tech, if you find, if you buy a low tech OSP from somebody you've never heard of, you're taking a risk. But the companies out there, two or three that are making significant uh, contributions to the performance of OSP, they've upped the game significantly. Many of them are on fifth generation molecules. These are synthesized organic azol molecules that that just do a fantastic job. And I would not hesitate to recommend it for numerous applications. That's interesting how that's evolved over time. I, I wasn't aware of that until you mentioned it to me recently. And and that's some of the magic of chemistry that just runs in the background of our industry. And until sometimes it seems like until there's a problem, that's right. We don't we don't talk about it. So I'm, I'm glad to sort of have this discussion. That's a good point. To that point, Judy, when black pad showed up, what people will call brittle fracture. Yeah, it sent the industry back, you know, 15 years for Enoch because they didn't understand it. Um, they wanted to blame the phosphorus content of the nickel deposit, but that turned out to be incorrect. It turned out that the cause of that was the galvanic effect. When you put immersion gold on top of nickel, you're not electrolytically plating it. You're causing it to, you're, you're doing an immersion deposit, also known as galvanic cells. So for gold to deposit on nickel, some nickel actually has to corrode and leave the surface so that the gold can take its place. And that's the main difference of an immersion deposit. Well, what was happening is because of the way things were being uh, run, pH, nickel morphology, roughness, et cetera, the, the galvanic effect was significantly large, causing this corrosion, significant corrosion to take place on the nickel surface. And that would impact negatively the formation of the solder joint and there you would get brittle fracture. You drop something, it breaks. So things are better now, but I still would be very careful. If you told me I'm going to put Enig on my boards today, I would say, well, do a first article. Make sure that the board design you have will not end up with this issue. Mm, that's a good. That's good advice. And you know, for people who are listening. Again, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, and I'm not going to apologize for it, um, is that um, you need to get into a board house, find the time, because most really good world-class board houses, you're going to go in and you're going to be surprised to see, and Mike can talk about this, the complexity of the labs they have in place to make sure that their chemicals are stable and doing what they're supposed to do. Mike, I imagine you've spent just more than a little bit of time inside of board houses 
discussing chemical balance. And um, if you would, to jump in on what the choice of surface finish has on the fabricator and why the designer should know about that. Right. Yeah, well, first, let's go back to your first question about these uh, board fabricators, the ones that are high quality board fabricators. And I'm looking at not just on the surface finishing side, but also other aspects of the circuit board fabrication, including electrolysis, copper, you know, direct metallization. The amount of control that they have in place, process control, automation, you know, to keep the plating and the, or the, the key ingredients within a very tight operating window. And that's not difficult if you invest the time and you have the commitment to ensure that. I can tell you how many times, Judy, I've been in situations where I've had to troubleshoot a problem because someone said, I've got this issue, I've got that issue. You go there and you find out that they were running the chemistry basically way outside the window. Well, why'd you do this? Well, we, we only check it once every two shifts. Well, you can't have a high volume operation like what you're doing right. and then check the chemistry once every two shifts. And I'm telling you, 90% of these problems that I see related to process are related to incorrect use of the product, the chemistry, and mishandling of the controls that are available to you. Now, does that mean that the fabricator needs to work much closer with the supplier? But if the supplier is already doing this for them, you know, the, the fabricator needs to take some responsibility. But again, I've been with a number of companies who have complete failure analysis labs also in their facility. So they take it to a very high level. They're basically their own qualification facility to ensure that they understand where the issues are. They categorize every defect. And those are the kinds of ones you, you, you want to work with. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I've, I've worked for shops like that where mm -hmm. they literally had PhDs in chemistry running the lab. They were doing their own cross-section. They were. And, you know, when, when suddenly there's a spike in um, volume, if you're not on top of it and you don't have those people and all of a sudden, whoops, production went up, but we're still checking our baths at the same rate <laughs> we were before. That's and right. then like, oh, what happened? Well, you know, there's all these things that need to be taken, you know, taken in consideration and adjusted accordingly. So um, what other fabrication considerations are there that, that maybe designers or engineers that are designing boards would want to consider as they decide what they're going to choose. Well, good. That's a good point. And and you know, I know design's important because there, there's this conundrum in our in our supply chain. The the fabricator wants to you know is looking for design for manufacturing, and the designer is is designing something to work in a, in a, in a certain fashion. You know, electrical uh, performance. Uh, dielectric spacing and and they don't take into consideration potentially what that does what that how that impacts the bare board fabrication process so mm -hmm. that's very significant right what uh, and, and I'm gonna go back to this because I, I find this to be an, an issue as well with on the assembly side boards come into the assembler they come from somewhere and they call me and say I have the, the plating is lifting from the surface when we assemble or the solder mask is lifting. Well, I said, do you, did you specify the grade of solder mask? Do you even know what solder mask is being put on the board that you're bringing in to assemble? Well, no, no. Then I find out, it's very easy for me to find out that they're use the, the fabricator, wherever they are, typically not here, are using a low $10 a kilo solder mask because no one specified it. And of course that yeah. $10 a kilo solder mask or less is probably going to work beautiful on a handheld child's toy. It's not going to work very well for your medical device and you're going to have right. all these other problems. So I think I'd hope the designers would get more involved in understanding the difficulties in making a bare board and also understand that just don't specify in a pick because it sounds great. It sounds sexy. Um, because number one, you're probably not paying for it. Somebody else has to have to pay for that in a peg and at $12 and $10 a square foot. You know, understand, and this is where, you know, again, the board designers are looking for the electrical performance. Do they ask where the board is going to be used? Is it going to be in a harsh use environment? Is it going to be in a benign environment, clay modeling studio? You know, th this is the, the key questions for them. Typically, what I see designers do is say, this is how the board should be built. These are the layers. These are the holes. And um, you should use this material with this dielectric constant. That's all great. But it, it, it 
it's not enough. Right. And, you know, I, I, I've been teaching this advanced troubleshooting course for printed circuit board fabrication for years. And you'd be surprised at the number of designers that actually take that course. And they ask the craziest questions, which tells me they haven't been outside of the outside of the board fabrication, outside of their design studio. Yeah. They need to understand that. They need to live with that a little bit. I would put every designer at least in a circuit board fabricator for two weeks and have them build a board that they designed. Yep. I agree. It's a hard, um, we encourage that here a lot and almost every guest on here says the same thing mm -hmm. um, because you and I have been around the block a little while and understand that there's time constraints for them to get out. However, the long-term cost of not getting out there and not onboarding and, you know, this is another plug. You know, you and I have been around IPC a while. This is another plug um, for CID and CID plus training as well, because, um, there you onboard some of these things that, that may be outside of the obvious, uh, things right. that are around manufacturing and assembly. So true. Kelly Dack wants to start field trips on every CID course. I'm like, yes, let's do it. <laughs> you know, not be, that, but to me, that would be fantastic. And to be honest with you, um, I and, know. you know, being heavily involved myself in, in IPC, one of the things that I've suggested that when CIDs and CID pluses earn their certifications, they should also have to get some understanding in coursework and practical on the bare board fabrication. You should make it like you did in, in, in college, you know, the, the practicals. You know, you just didn't do the book work. You had to go into the right. lab. Exactly. And, 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 and apply what you just learned from the book because if you couldn't res res you know, resort it to practice, at the end of the day, if you can't practice it, yeah, y you've not learned. And, um, and as so we both know, the cost of ignorance in these areas is so high, like yes. avoidable mistakes. You know, if you take the time Costly. on the front end. Costly. You know, I've, I've seen entire, um, Clay modeling studio shut down or paper mill shut down because the again the paper mill folks were, were buying the controls from a, the the OEM who was specifying the boards to be made but the finish, so the poor you know <laughs> industrial automation company using these expensive controls now wondering why their expensive instruments are no longer doing what they're supposed to do and they find out that there's creep corrosions in there because the OEM specified immersion silver or bought the board somewhere cheap who where the individuals, companies decided to cut corners like they do to meet the cost, like not putting enough gold on, not putting enough nickel right. on. You know, there's specs for a reason. <clears throat> there is, absolutely. And, uh, you know, but that's always for discussion for another time. Yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> and then, yeah. Sure is. And then there's all, everything you're doing, HD Pug, which is another podcast I'd like to get you on for as well. Um, I want to put a pin in our conversation right now because I realized in the beginning I failed to mention to our listeners that you may hear some background noise here. There's some, um, well, what I, what I was telling our producers is, you know, we're building a better podcast. It's noisy in here, but really what's happening is we have some c construction. And of course, it's overhead in the green room here in our La Jolla office. So, you know, it's directly overhead on this day, of course. So sure. um, please, uh, please excuse any background noise. Um, so, Mike, you sit on boards for international companies as well as um, b companies here, and you are a respected and trusted advisor. And you mentioned to me about things that the Japanese are doing that are very innovative, and that is that they're mixing finishes and doing selective finishes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, and this is, uh, if you can see in the IC substrate side, in the Japanese or, you know, the ones who really made miniaturization go. I mean, they understood how to make yeah. things small, yeah. not just lawnmowers and engines like, you know, Toyota Camrys and things like in the Prius, but they, they figured out early on how to do it with circuit boards and, and putting more functionality on a chip. Matter of fact, that's where OSP was actually invented, was in Japan. Oh. Uh, in those days, it was called preflux because, you know, in, in this rudimentary 1970s day. But uh, they pioneered the OSP. And matter of fact, today, the, the leading OSP company in, in the world is uh, Shikoku Chemical out of Japan. They continue to evolve that chemistry. And, um, you know, I trust them immensely. So 
going back to that question, they, what you do is in, in the IC substrate market where you've got a complex chip that has to have uh, gold leads you know, or gold um, you know, wire bonding, you have on one side of the substrate um, nickel gold, and then you bond the chip with the wires to that to that feature. But then on the flip side, which is going to be a BGA uh, feature, you have bare copper, which is OSP. So mm. they have the BGA balls on the on the bottom side, and the IC substrate, uh, the the chip actually the the, the die as they call it, um, on the top side. So you have enig on selectively on one side and bare copper meaning OSP on the other. And of course it's a flip chip. So with with the uh, IC substrate or the IC chip in there, you marry that um, BGA to the bare su- surface of the copper board, meaning an, an OSP, mm-hmm. and you've got this fantastic package, if you will. Instead of doing it all the nickel gold or all in enipin, right. you do it selectively. Hmm. And they've developed these these processes, and they've also developed a selective imaging, if you will, to make that happen. But it's a, it's a relatively easy to do once you understand the ramifications and how to make it work and make sure you don't get... You know, you have a, a, an OSP that doesn't, let's say, attack the exposed nickel gold, all these things. Yeah, it's pretty pretty uh, intricate, but it's been around for some time and, and with, with a lot of success. So that's selective enig, as they call it. Interesting. So I was just going to ask you, what does that do to cost and process? You're saying it's not difficult. How about cost implications? Well, there is additional cost of putting the, the second imaging step down to protect the, the board from plating where you don't want it to go. But instead of doing the entire IC substrate, in nickel gold, you're doing just one portion of it where the where the uh, wires from the chip are are placed from the die. So that does help you significantly in the long run. It also makes the BGA perform better because you're you're marrying basically tin to bare copper, yeah. making another opportunity there. Mm-hmm. Do you think that will find its way here into <laughs> North America? <laughs> well, you know the thing is, there's a not only a few. Uh, Fabricators here do work in the substrate industry. Most of the substrate work is done yeah. in Asia for the Amcors and the Intels and the Samsung. So you see a lot of the supply chain there. You're right. But some big American owned companies in Asia are doing it and doing gotcha. it in volume. Right. But again, you want to see IC substrate packaging at its best. It's um, it's the Japanese. Yeah, that makes sense. The Ibidens of the world are you know the leaders and they've been doing that for 30 years. So they, you know, they tend to be ahead of their time, but now the time has come. Yeah, interesting. Well, it's interesting to get your perspective on sort of a global scale as well. Um, well, this has been great. Our time is coming to a close here, but will you please share with us links to any <laughs> white papers or <laughs> slide decks or anything you have? Because I, I think how I want to wrap up is, Mike, if you were a designer, what would you do with all this information? I mean, we've kind of shared it sort of anecdotally and quickly here, but if you wanted to learn more about this, where would you go? And, and, and what kind of things maybe can you share with our listeners that we can throw in the show notes so they can maybe well, get, get better at this? Well, very good. Well, I would encourage you, to, excuse me, <coughs> designers who haven't taken a, an IPC course outside of design, I encourage okay. you to take them. You know, look on the IPC website. We just had, uh, you know, Apex where, in addition to technical papers, there were workshops on a number of different subjects, including my advanced troubleshooting course, but there was also courses on basically the basics of bare board fabrication. And some of the instructors do a great job of of giving you the, the tour, if you will, of the very basics. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can get a feel for how the board starts with bare laminate, actually starts from the design and actually ends with the finished product going out to assembly from a from a manufacturing standpoint. Right. Then you can follow that up by taking the advanced troubleshooting so you can understand where some of the problems and technical issues come from when the board is fabricated with the various chemical steps and the mechanical steps like drilling and plating and you know immersion gold and you know silver, whatever you need to do. That would be something you should do. And also watch for IPC tech ed where they're going to be putting more and more of these courses standalones in different parts of the country, whether it be San Jose, San Diego. We just did a course in Boston uh, back in April, which was uh, well attended. And we just had the high reliability conference in Baltimore this few weeks ago, which had a high military arrow uh, content to it. But there's webcast as well. Uh, and also, so I encourage you to look at the IPC 
uh, website, ipc.org. Go through the technical papers. Look for the events that are going on there. But obviously, at every apex, there will be this myriad of, right. of courses to take. And I, I encourage you to get your, you know, go to your boss and say, look, this is something I think will benefit me. And um, you're going to send me there anyways for the other other uh, events. So why not get there on a Sunday and take this course? Yeah, so, good advice. You know, SMTA is another good place, mm. smta.org. A lot of technical papers yep. and seminars and webinars uh, related to things like surface finishes and design for reliability, et cetera. As a matter of fact, IPC actually has a design for manufacturing uh, workshop uh, that is taught by some really highly skilled people too. So that might be something that a designer would, would benefit from. Very um, good. Because the designer, an actual designer is actually teaching the course from experience because he lives it. He, you know, they live mm. it. Yeah. They not only built bare boards, you know, I'm talking about Gary Ferrari and right. like Susie Webb and those folks. They've actually built boards and they, and so, but they also design, you know, Happy right. Holden, he's built boards, he designs boards. He understands it. They get it. Right. You know, that'd be an interesting perspective for, yeah. for all of those out there. Okay, good. That's great stuff. Well, we'll make sure to attach the links to IPC and um, I know they, they're they doing a lot with education right now and so I'll make sure and if you have anything to share with me please do and we'll make sure and we also uh, include links to RBP Chemical yep rbpchemical.com dot com and then we will um, share anything else that you want and I'm hoping I might be able to twist Mike's arm to come teach a surface finish course at Altium Live in October, but we'll see. He's so in demand. <laughs> He's a popular guy. So, um, but if I had my wish, that's what we would do because I think it'd be a great place again. Um, hope to have about five, six hundred designers there. So I think they would benefit. So, Mike, thank you again. You're a dear friend, and thank you so much for always freely. Uh, sharing your information. Mike also writes a column for PCB 007 magazine called Trouble in Your Tank and that's where I learned a lot and actually how I became friends with Mike is asking him if I could please take some of his content and repurpose it for blogs I was writing so uh, <laughs> we'll also include that link to his his column so Mike thank you again your dear contributor and friend to the industry and thanks so much for taking time of your busy day to do this with us it's been fun well thank you judy thanks for uh, inviting me i appreciate it you have mm -hmm. a great day thanks you too again this has been judy warner with all teams on track podcast and mike carano of rbp chemical please join us again next time until then always stay on track <laughs>